Thank you so much for coming. We're delighted to present Jean Rondeau today here at the library. It's very exciting to have you here. Welcome. Thank you very much. I'm Ann McLean from the Music Division, and this is my colleague David Plylar. And I wanted to say that we don't usually double team artists like this, but uh, David's voice is disappearing, so I'm just here as a relief pitcher in case. Um, Jean, you've brought an elegant and thoughtful program of Bach and Scarlatti today with the title Italian Recycling. And I know that you've said that creating a program is uh, something you enjoy very much, and I wanted to ask you to talk about how you go about creating such a program as this. Um, hi, hello everyone. Um, so the, um, the program is, uh, for me to create a program is to create a, a musical form. Um, like, of course we have to, to settle the pieces together in terms of styles and energy, but also um, to feel what it could make to the audience to, you know, to play through pieces like this. Uh, also, uh, we have to take care of the keys, different keys, tonality, <coughs> tonality. And, um, and yeah, for me, like it's, uh, like one program should be like one big piece in a way. Even like there is like breaks and applause or whatever, but it's um, like inside one piece, sometimes there is silence or breathing. And so a program uh, would, uh, should be like, like this, like, uh, like a journey, like a story, a storytelling in a way. Um, one question I have for you, um, I don't know if you can hear me, but <clears throat> uh, when you're coming up with these programs, do you think of um, sort of thematic links between them? Because as I'm listening to you playing, I hear things like at the, with the Marcello, um, with the uh, central movement of the Italian concerto having a certain um, match to them in terms of uh, feel. And, and uh, <clears throat> I don't know how far into the weeds you might want to get with that, but is that uh, just something that is also a, a, a thought about uh, motivic and thematic material and how those might be related across. Yeah, sure, like that, that's a question of the, of the style and uh, like the idea of the program, like you came here to listen to harpsichord and um, like 18th century music and uh, maybe to create bridges between the composers, like uh, between, uh, for example, Bach and Italian music and for example, this Marcello concerto, which has been worked by Marcello, but like Bach uh, worked on those kind of concerto to get inside the Italian style and to try to yeah to understand the style from inside. And um, but also Bach is a kind of a outsider, like um, in a way he's writing not like a very new music and he's uh, not traveling as much as other composer from that time, like Handel or Telemann. And, um, and Scarlatti also is an outsider uh, by his own, um, like getting, like not traveling a lot, neither like he, like from Italy to Portugal and Spain, of course, but staying with the, with the court and um, being like, quite alone in uh, his uh, production, in his music, and in his style. And so, I mean, like, the music of Bach and music of Scarlatti is very, very different uh, in the style, but still I like the, to associate them uh, by their uh, unique uh, way of writing music and uh, the unique approach also of the keyboard. And, uh, and sometimes also it's great to just create links by ourselves and uh, about how we feel also. You, in general, I think you have a very adventurous uh, uh, approach to both the music making and the selection of repertoire. And the Scarlatti, I think, in particular, um, <clears throat> I don't know if, if, if how many people in the audience have had a chance to uh, listen to this um, music, 
And also, uh, you have a new uh, CD that's, um, that features um, a selection of 15, I think, Scarlatti sonatas um, out of 550 plus. Um, <clears throat> there's something um, uh, about this time period and um, uh, also in the, in the French repertoire that you also r record with Rameau and uh, Rayet and um, uh, that's so uh, dramatic harmonically and, and stuff. Um, and I'm wondering if you could say a bit about um, the Scarlatti, because some of these pieces are famous for their um, dissonances and the, mm -hmm. the clusters and the, the types of effects um, that <clears throat> are, are quite different when heard on a piano, but um, kind of really come to life when it heard by a harpsichord. Yes, yeah, so, uh, as you said, like Scarlatti wrote a lot of, ska of uh, sonatas, and he had access with, uh, uh, with different instruments, harpsichords, different harpsichords, but also he, he knew the piano and the organ. So like the Scarlatti sonatas are mainly written for the harpsichord, but some of the sonatas could really fit really well for the piano also. When I say piano, it's piano of the East time, of course. And uh, also there is a few sonatas dedicated to organ. But um, like, what you said about this, uh, like he used a, a special technique of um, of a way of actually uh, like in harpsichord you you do a lot of arpeggio, like uh, it's a way of expression, but uh, somehow he's also sometimes using appoggiature and real note in the same time, so it it creates this, what you were talking about, like this uh, really dissonances. And it came, I think, more from the guitar, when like a, a guitar player would like uh, plug all the strings together, even like there is appoggiatures. And it's called in Italian acciaccature. And yeah, it creates something really dramatic. And, um, but what I, I find the most, uh, really surprising in the harmonical journey of Scarlatti music, Scarlatti sonatas, is somehow he, he made some uh, harmonical progressions than no one have ever made before him and actually after him too. Like he's, he's really unique in the musical form, uh, plus uh, inside the mu uh, harmonical um, progressions. Sometimes, I don't know if you are a bit familiar with uh, degrees, like in music, like, you have, like the, 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 the degrees is what, what is uh, it's the equivalent of the architecture of the music. And it's the, all the like, it creates the, the, the story, even it's not really, a, uh, it's a bit hid hidden, you know, it's technical, but like sometimes, Scarlatti goes from one degree to another, and you never find that in any music, except, for example, like pop music from the 60s or more new music. But like it's very unique, and he has been the first to do certain musical uh, drawing, and uh, and yeah, and never before uh, before. Well, my English is, uh, you know, I have to, I'm not English uh, native speaker. Um, I read that he, Scarlatti, had been uh, using elements of even street music. Of? Of street music. Yeah. Folk mu elements and so yeah, on. Yeah, exactly. Like, he was really inspired by the, the pop, what we call popular music, like the, the music he could find around him. You know, and in particular in, in, yeah, in Portugal, but in Spain, south of Spain, he has been like to Andalusia, in Seville, and, and we know that there were a lot of uh, musicians in the street, and in particular like guitar player, um, who were like playing guitar and singing in the same time. And there is a lot of sonatas uh, like this, like when on the left hand I play like chords, l a bit like a, the, the, the chords from the guitar, and the right hand is doing the melody, a bit like the, the singing. And it's, it's quite obvious also, like, it's funny because the, the left hand with the chords 
does not really respect the harmonical rules of keyboard in general. Like you can feel, like, oh, it's it's weird to do that, you know. And I think it's because the guitar has not the same uh, pattern of um, association of notes because of the the tuning, like because of the of the, the yeah the tuning of the of the strings. And so we can really feel that, like uh, actually from a historical point of view, like of the musician from the street, but also inside the music, you can really feel this connection. And uh, and so may I will play the sonata 208 in A major, and it's typical. You will you might heard that it's typical this uh, chord on the left hand and melody, like uh, making think of the guitar and street musicians indeed one, one thing that's interesting to to kind of <clears throat> compare then is if he's if he has some of these folk influences is that um, with his uh, <clears throat> uh, writing these presumably for uh, the eventually the Queen of Spain and the the context in which they're being presented um, it's just a it's kind of a striking contrast but I wonder um, I know that he, uh, the first batch was published in 1738 or something as the um, exercises, um, but were there, <clears throat> what sort of a, a broader influence do you feel like uh, that his music might have had at the time um, w in terms of keyboard music with other composers, or do you feel like it, it took a while because it, most of it wasn't published until later? Yeah, it's, it's difficult to <coughs> know exactly how much the composer after Scarlatti knows new his music, actually. We can feel connection somehow with the music after him uh, in the style, but it doesn't mean that the composers knew his music really well. Uh, so it's kind of difficult to, to precisely know about, about that. But uh, I think he's very, uh, like, a, a a pre precursor, precursor in this, uh, in the style that we will find uh, more in the second half of the 18th century. But also, yeah, what is uh, interesting also is that all those sonatas he wrote uh, was mainly dedicated to his uh, only pupil, the the Queen Maria Barbara, and. Um, and it's like exercises, and you, we can we can see and feel all the different, even technical approach, technical aspects on the keyboard. Like it's, he's exploring a lot, uh, also to to make her practicing, and uh, I think it's 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 quite impressive. Like you have, yeah, more than 550 sonatas with uh, almost the same musical form in two parts. And inside those really uh, repetitive uh, form, you have like so many ideas, uh, really imaginative way of writing music. And, uh, and yeah, I think it was really in order for his pupil to, to, to practice, to explore the keyboards and uh, etc. So I, I really like the idea of the sonatas as uh, exercises, uh, like uh, wh how was called the first publication, it was exercises. Like uh, then it was also published as sonatas, but I like the idea of uh, exercises, like a bit like Bach also, like when he wrote the what he called the clavier ubong, ubong mean exercise, and it, I find really moving to always uh, remind that all the Scarlatti sonatas, like also the, the well-tempered clavier and the Goldberg, are exercises. That's a really good point to make, too, is that it's not just, um, you don't just mean technical exercises, but also musical ones. Because, I mean, if we're looking back at the Scarlatti, there's so many that are um, uh, just uh, musically rich and not necessarily as technically demanding. But then there's, at the other extreme, there's ones that there's, uh, require extreme virtuosity. Yeah, and also, yeah, among the, the technical aspect, there is like, for me, uh, what I really like is uh, maybe the position uh, composers like Bach or Scarlatti could have with their own uh, works. Like, for example, a composer today would be more its mind, 
you know, what he words, what he writes, is belongs to himself. Mm -hmm. I think I like, I really like the idea in general that the music doesn't belong to anyone, even when you compose it. Like, and as an exercises, I think about that a lot. Like the the very humble position they could have with uh, their own music too. You know, maybe flipping that around a little bit, <clears throat> in a sense, um, when we go back to the Marcello, uh, that's, that comes from a time, I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think Bach was in Weimar at the time doing his, uh, uh, where he did, took these Italian concerti and did these transcriptions for keyboard. Um, and it's almost like a, a, a practice for him as a composer um, as well, and, and so that it strikes me that that's uh, something there. And again, uh, uh, kind of not just not taking ownership. He acknowledges uh, sometimes incorrectly, I guess, but acknowledges who the original composer was. But um, <clears throat> that's an interesting uh, thing there. And it's also um, a factor uh, that comes into play with the rest of your program as well, with this notion of transcription. And I'm wondering if you can. Um, you know, it's it's one thing in the case of the Marcello where, where you have a, a, a written out version, but in the case of the Chacon, um, it's kind of been mediated through uh, Brahms and through um, through others to go from solo violin to keyboard. And so I'm and um, I've heard your uh, recording, um, which is great. Um, you uh, on your Imagine CD, uh, I think. Um, uh, maybe you could talk a bit about that process of making a work that is so uh, associated with that solo violin and then uh, making it successful on the harpsichord. Um, yeah, uh, actually, uh, also like Bach loved to recycle his own uh, music and also uh, he liked to do himself transcription of his own music, like from one cantata to one patient to one concerto, etc. So I think it, it's also raised the question of the, the position uh, within his music. And, um, and for, the, for the Chacon, he wrote this Chacon for the violin, of course. It's the only Chacon Bach wrote. And, um, and actually, so. It's more uh, also a personal uh, connection I have with this piece that the first time I heard this piece was on the harpsichord, and uh, I really uh, loved it. And um, and uh, yeah, I like also uh, the first time I heard it was also this transcription. I I like it very much because Brahms wrote uh, so this transcription for the piano for the left hand only in order that the, the, the player can, could feel the same sensation of difficulty than a violinist could, could, could feel. And um, I think he wrote that in a letter to, to Clara Schumann. And, and so as it's only for one hand for the piano, uh, we are very close by the original text, actually. Um, like he, in the transcription, he wrote dynamics and stuff for the piano, it's more the transcription on the piano is more about the left hand and also all the the expression and dynamics uh, writing on the score. So on the harpsichord, it's like even the transcription of the transcription because I'm playing it with two hands because there is no such turn pedal on the harpsichord. So if I play it just with one hand, we lose a lot of the harmonical journey and, and resonances and stuff. But so in the harpsichord, you are in the low medium register, which is very charming and it's very simple. Like uh, sometimes it's just like mono D, sometimes there is chords, but uh, I like because there is the connection is uh, very much uh, with the original music. And uh, yeah. You know, one. Uh, <clears throat> like if you look at the other extreme, if you look at the Brissoni transcription for piano, um, that's an adaptation that works. At, you know, at, one has opinions about these things, but um, it's definitely been adapted to work really well for the piano. And it feels like that going through the Brahms and the decisions there, the types of arpeggiations he makes, um, works for the harpsichord. But what also works for it um, are the types of um, 
considerations you give it with ornamentation and other things like that um, that just make it feel at home, so at least in the recordings I've heard. But, um, <clears throat> one thing we haven't talked about uh, is the Italian concerto. Um, and do you want to say anything about that uh, related to his Italian transcriptions or, or um, just about the piece in general? I think he wrote like he was really inspired by all the work all the works he did with all these Italian concerto by Vivaldi, Marcello, etc., uh, on which he did like a transcription. Maybe it gives, it gave him the idea of written like a Italian concerto in that way that from those transcription for, for keyboard, he decided to write a concerto for keyboard. So it's not really a concerto, but it's from that dynamic he created with his works, with uh, this music. And so it's a really typical three movements um, Italian uh, concerto, and uh, he's playing a lot with uh, different uh, keyboards on the harpsichord and the way of expression of the harpsichord to create a lot of different colors, and also to create the sensation of uh, tutti and solo. It's, it's quite clear when you hear this piece than uh, uh, like with the music itself, but also with the play of the two manuals of the harpsichord, that like there is like a really concrete part of solo and, and tutti. So it's kind of crazy piece because you are alone and uh, playing a concerto, but for just for one instrument, but inside you can hear a lot of different instruments. Like in a way, sometimes there is like bass line, which remind us the cellos, there is like a um, solo line on the right hand who could remind us of the violin, etc. And sometimes just like a sensation of orchestra. So it's great, crazy piece. Well, the, um, yeah, I mean, it's a great piece. Uh, everybody, it's hard to look at a piece by Bach and not say it's a great piece, but <clears throat> um, it's paired with, uh, um, I think it's the French Overture, the, a very large um, work. And I'm wondering if you could say a few things just about this um, something that doesn't seem quite as uh, uh, pertinent today as maybe it once was, but the, the nationality um, effect on, um, like, why uh, Bach would write a, uh, an Italian concerto and have that nationality be um, kind of in the forefront. Um, yeah, I think the concept of uh, nationality uh, was very different uh, back at the time, and also in Germany, where like I'm not, I'm not an historian, sure. but uh, still, uh, the Germany was uh, divided. Like it was not a united country, like we know, like today. Um, the the Italy was the same, actually. So, like more the region uh, or a small area could be more, uh, could have more this impact of of uh, nationality, like in the way we hear it uh, today. And also, I think the influences of different geographic uh, places in Europe uh, it depends a lot of how much the composer were traveling or not. How 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 score, scores he could have from different countries, from different composer and stuff. Because like today, we have the recording, we have the CDs, we of internet, so we are more connected to what could happen and uh, like very far from us. But at that time, uh, like when you go to the concert, or we, you listen to music only in live, only live music. And plus, if you don't like move a lot from your place and you don't have access to score, you could, you, there, there were composers who could be very isolated. And there were also other who were traveling a lot getting access to a lot of uh, music and uh, it depends like everything was also gravi gravitating uh, around the different courts in Europe. So it, it was also the place they could meet other composers, other musicians. Um, but yeah, Bach and Scarlatti, as we, we, we said uh, before, was more like Bach traveled, uh, also this big traveling for meeting books to hood. Uh, Scarlatti traveled also to follow the the, 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 court, the Spanish court. 
But in a way, even like Bach has access to this Italian music and also French music. And also like each time he has, he had access to those musics, he did a work also on that. Like he, he wrote also the French suite and the English suite. Um, so yeah, but um, what was the question? I oh, that, that <laughs> <laughs> no, that addressed it, I think. I mean, right. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, the question of how the, the influence. Um, so it, it depends very much on, on each composer's life and you know, speaking of influences, um, you're talking about uh, inf the regional and, and stylistic influences, and I wanted to ask you to talk a little bit about your own work today and the influences of music you work on, uh, such a wide variety, including jazz. I know that you have an ensemble that is involved with jazz. Is it Note Forget? But also, just how does it inform or affect your work in other areas? Um, actually, my main work is concentrated on uh, interpretation of uh, of uh, old music, and uh, but I think it's uh, from my my point of view, I, I'm really interesting also in new music, like uh, also because of the influences of composer from the past, because it's quite new than we play music. Um, like, like in the 18th century, in the 19th century, we were playing always contemporary music. Like 80% of the of the concerts was music from to uh, like contemporary. Now we are more into something like to play, you know, Beethoven, Mahler, Bach. So music from before, from the past. And uh, so it's also by the influence of, of, of this approach of the music that like I, I love to, to, to work on past music, but I, th I think it's also really important to stay connected from what, uh, which music is creating now. Uh, and, uh, and to not to, to, to separate like just like oh there is music from the past and there is music from today like there is a continuity also and so i think it's really important to stay really aware really curious and as i said we had we have great chance to have internet and recording so we could uh, you know uh, uh, fulfill our curiosity and um and so yeah so i'm i, I have different projects with more actual and contemporary music, even like for harpsichord, sometimes I'm writing new music for harpsichord, or, or I'm, for example, I'm in a baroque ensemble on historical uh, instruments, period instruments, and we will do like next month uh, a, a piece from a, a contemporary composer, like a new music, and also I have like a different uh, groups of music on which I'm playing piano or keyboards, and and on which we are thinking and working on, on new music and also new form of music and how we could, uh, you know, keep doing the work, all those composers, uh, as uh, all this uh, beautiful legacy we have to do. Yeah, I think it's important. What type of, uh, <coughs> what type of repertoire do you see yourself exploring uh, in the coming years? Uh, are you gonna do more Scarlatti or are you moving away from that? Are in performance. So the on the harpsichord, the repertoire for harpsichord is huge. Like it's very, very big. It's even bigger than than piano. Like it's, uh, let's say, to sum up, like beginning of uh, 16th century until the end of 18th century. So three centuries of music, and it's very uh, prolific. And uh, yeah, there's a lot of. Uh, so also like, it's quite difficult to you know, to arrive at the end of something with the harpsichord repertoire, like it's so huge and also like so different from, uh, I don't know, the English music for of 16th century to French music of the end of 18th century, like even the style is completely different. It's like, it's like the difference is as huge as the difference between Mozart and Stravinsky, you know, and also like of the, the time also like it's it's like two centuries like 
who could uh, separate like uh, <laughs> different sides. And also, as we spoke about the, the, the connection between the, the countries and the difficulties sometimes to get in, into different music. Um, so so it, it's huge and I think I, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to, to continue to, to explore all this repertoire. And also, for example, when I have a, I don't know, a album project, I'm really focused on, on one composer. Like for example, for the Scarlatti, I wrote, play, I, I, I uh, cite, read all the Scarlatti sonatas, you know, to choose and then to create a program and stuff. And, uh, and my next project will be, uh, uh, like I, I, in terms of album, uh, will, will be a CD with, uh, uh, in duo with a lute player around like music from uh, Versailles uh, composers. Then I will do like a, a program with different composer of 17th, 16th and 17th century, including uh, for, for Berger, Frescobaldi, and also vir virginalist music, like uh, English music. So yeah, I, I think it's it's quite huge and uh, yeah, that's great. You know, I wonder um, at this point would it be uh, we could take some audience questions? Oh yeah, sure. I think it's uh, yeah because I'm speaking, but I don't know if you are interested in what I'm saying. <laughs> so maybe the best is to answer questions if you have questions if you about could just wait anything until I, uh, except American police uh, politics. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, <laughs> if you could wait for the uh, um, a microphone to come to you. Oh, I can I can repeat the question also, you know, like, you know. All right, all right. Uh, thank you. It was very interesting to hear about it. I was just wondering. I know you said there's a lot of harpsichord music, but can you play a piece that's written for the piano or the spinet on the harpsichord, or does it have to be modified? Uh, the the spinet and harpsichord is the same family of instrument. The piano is very different uh, on uh, the mechanics, the technique, the way of create expression on the piano is very, very different. Sometimes you can, sometimes you, you cannot. Like, for example, as I, I, sp I spoke about Scarlatti, as he knew the piano, sometimes and somehow there is sonatas who could work perfectly well for piano and for harpsichord. And even if it's modern piano, like piano from today, it could work also because it's the same instrument. It's not the same instrument, uh, but it's the same um, or original. Originally, it's the same instrument. Like it's called a piano, uh, so it's the same uh, approach of expression. But for example, if you want to, like there is like music. If you want to play in another instrument of uh, um, of which it, it has been composed, you have to do a transcription. Like for example, if I take just a few examples, uh, Couperin, François Couperin's music uh, for harpsichord has been really written for harpsichord. Like on the contrary, like Scarlatti, it could be different keyboards, but even Bach, it could be different keyboards because Bach sometimes wrote for keyboards and you could play something on the organ, on the harpsichord, and so on. But François Couperin harpsichord music is very dedicated to harpsichord. So if you play François Couperin on the piano, you can, but you have to do transcriptions. So you have to, to position yourself in a way you have to work on how you could transform, transcribe the expression from one instrument to another. So you have to ask yourself a lot of questions of why you do that and how and, and etc. You cannot just take the music and play in, playing it on the piano, N just because it's a keyboard, you know. But on, on the same way, if you want to play, for example, like a very uh, pianistic music, for example, Liszt or Chopin on the harpsichord, you have to do a transcription. To, you, know. you cannot just play it like this, it, it won't work. So I think, <coughs> Like, as Bach did also with his own work, with his own piece, like to use materials from one instrumentation to another. Like, I think in music everything is possible if you just ask yourself the good questions and you adopt the good position uh, between the music and, and, and yourself. I have a two-part question. Um, it's historical, not, not, not detailed. 
Do you think Scarlett had a lot of influence on Luigi Boccherini? Uh, so the question is, uh, is uh, Scarlett has a lot of influence on Boccherini music? And as I said previously, I don't really know how much the composer after Scarlatti had access to his music. And in particular for Boccherini, I have not a lot of clues about that. So I could not say. I ask that because when I listen to, for instance, the early, um, well, the, the English transcriptions of Scarlatti's keyboard music done by Addison, who did the visual orchestral music, yeah. they don't sound like Scarlatti. Yeah, yeah, true. No, but Boccherini does. Yeah. And that's why I was wondering about but that. sometimes you could like have two composers from the same period of time wh who could not know the music of each other, and it could looks like very, very much uh, the same. So sometimes it's also more like I don't really believe in like oh there is one composer and there is a major com influence from just this guy. You know, like it's uh, the influence is is uh, very large, and it's in music. But even for musician and composer, with all the component of uh, of a society of arts, you know, architectures, uh, the social way of doing music in a period of time, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, I think everything is an influence for composers. So, like, of course, when we hear Bach music we, and Buxtehude music, we say, oh, okay, it's very much uh, influenced by Buxtehude, but still it's not only Buxtehude. Like if you just take Buxtehude and Bach, you know, Bach uh, would not have wrote what he wrote if it was just that, you know, like there it's, it's I think it's very much more than that. And the second part of the question. The part, if I've got my dates right, <laughs> it seems to me that at the Spanish court, while Scarlatti was there, there was another musician who was a member of the court who was even more famous than Scarlatti. Does anybody here have an idea who that might be? Farinelli? Farinelli, yes. <laughs> and <laughs> did, did Scarlatti ever write vocal music for him? I mean, he had. Not really. Farinelli, no, it's. Remember, Yeah, like, as I said, like, in the courts, like, it was very much the place where a lot of musicians could meet, play together and stuff. But actually, Scarlatti didn't <laughs> write a lot of vocal music. He did, like, uh, a few um, sacred music. But uh, it's very... There is, like, some big mystery in Scarlatti's life, I think. Like, there is a period of time we don't even know what he was doing or like it's it's very dark like and he was described as a really also very uh, introvert and dark person so on the contrary of of Farinelli who was like the big star in Europe in Italy and in Spain too <coughs> but actually it's more um, Far Farinelli wrote uh, some uh, letters about Scarlatti after that, like oh, also the, he wrote uh, what is so about these composers, but we don't really know how far was the musical relationship with, between the two of them. Um, we know they met, but uh, it's true that there is not this uh, particular music dedicated for Farinelli, who, who was a star, and and a connection, like, obvious between the two guys. But but still, also, it depends also of the of the person. Like, Scarlatti was maybe re that introvert that he was doing his work, and, you know, um, like, I don't know, like, there is big stars, singer today, and it doesn't mean like everyone is writing for them, you know? One thing I, I think, if I under, my understanding is that uh, Farinelli's, uh, a lot of information about Scarlatti comes to us through those letters of Farinelli. So that's um, just a, a piece.
as far as like about more personal information. So there's not a ton of information, but. In your, in your answer to the first question up front, you said that box music could be played on harpsichord or on piano or whatever. Was he doing that deliberately, making it general enough to play on any keyboard instrument? And would that have added complexity to the composing? Actually, he has a really specific connection with harpsichord and organ. And there is pieces like uh, the Goldberg Variations, for instance, or even the Italian Concerto, which really was written for harpsichord. And there is also all the organ work when you know you have like a pedal a line. Uh, it's really much for organ. But sometimes like there is also pieces which could be in between. You know, like Fantasia, like a Prelude, Fugue, from the, for example, well-tempered clavier, and and that's all that 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 those pieces could work really well. I mean, like in terms of expression, like like uh, an instrument. Uh, the composer is trying to know and to write music in order that the instrument express the music. So sometimes Bach, we can feel that a piece could be expressed with organ or with harpsichord. For the piano, it's quite, it's a bit different because he met the piano at the very end of his life. So it was not like a very, uh, he, he did not have a, a very specific and particular connection with uh, the piano. Um, but like it's more, the idea I, I wanted to compare with Bach because of, for example, Couperin, when he, he said, I'm writing for harpsichord. And sometimes Bach, there is pieces like, it just for a keyboard. And for him, keyboard was, around him was harpsichord and organ. So that's more what I wanted to say. What was the 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 piano you said the piano yeah you haven't mentioned clavichord but clavichord is very similar in action yeah, to true. piano it's true and I knew, I didn't all those composers would have been very familiar yeah, with it yeah I think there is is the same kind of relationship also with the clavichord there is some pieces who could really uh, well uh, fit with the clavichord because Bach knew the clavichord he has clavichord around but also um, like you said, spinet, you, you know, virginal. Like there is like different also name for different harpsichord. Clavichord, it's true. It's we have to be careful. It's the ancestor of the piano and not the, of the harpsichord, because the the, the string on the clavichord are um, hammered and like strike. I don't know how to say it instead of plucked. Yeah. Other questions? Maybe? Yeah. Uh, um, can I take you back to your other musical interests? Um, uh, some would say that the world of jazz is um, a very different world of music from that which you're here to play today. I, I wonder whether you could tell us a little bit about why uh, your interest in jazz is as it is. I'm guessing that you might actually see a relationship between the two musical worlds, but I shouldn't presume your answer. And, and secondly, um, of the jazz tradition, contemporary jazz pianists today, are there any uh, musicians that you're particularly influenced by or you have an admiration for? Um, actually, I, I'm not sure of seeing the, the music as a very linear, linear uh, as, you know, connection of, of time, you know, like, uh, and um, I'm not, I'm not, Particular interest in jazz. I think I'm really interesting in interested in in music, uh, and uh, I really want to explore every every different styles, every background of music. Every, there is a lot of music, but still, like I think in 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 uh, every music, in every musics, there is music, like. Um, and actually, for the jazz part, it's it's a bit particular. What what I am particularly into is to compose music, to write music, 
or to listen to new music, as we said before. Um, jazz, at first, was a dynamic, was a, uh, maybe a state of mind of being able to flexible the style to write music, to write new music. Like if you take, for example, the, 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 the life of Miles Davis, like he, like every year, he was doing another style of music because he was using the music of his time. And we said it's a jazz musician. So jazz, I'm not sure about jazz as a style of music. And like today, for example, when there is jazz musician who, is, who are playing bebop music, they are doing the same than when I'm playing Bach music because they play music from an old uh, period of time. So what I, I like in this jazz approach, jazz mine, is like to always be um, curious and to always fit in the style and in the music of your time, which is now a bit delicate because we don't feel and see the jazz like this. So I'm, I'm not sure about like using this, this word, jazz, you know. But I'm just like uh, really curious about every music. I, I'm too much in love with the music to to say, oh no, I don't like this. I don't like this. You know, like for me, like when I say I don't like this or I don't like this, I'm saying, okay, I'm liking a bit less music. I'm liking a bit less music, etc. Because as I I really feel that there is music inside every music, I could not say, oh yeah, that is good, that is bad, like. I um, I really my work is to to take care of my love for the music I think and the more I say oh no Handel no I don't like Handel <laughs> or uh, yeah there is people like this who love music but no the Stravinsky it's not my thing yeah. like I could not really I think we should be very humble also with that sometimes we some, we say we don't like it just like it's not maybe the good moment, and we should wait, or we should try to understand why. And so, so yeah, and the influence, like of course, the music has uh, influenced, like influence each other, like different styles and stuff. Yeah. I think, yeah. No, there is other questions. <laughs> <laughs> what time is it? One more? Okay. Two more. Two more. <laughs> I'm interested in knowing if you also perform on forte piano, and the rest of this question is, do you find music of the classical period suitable to play on the harpsichord? Mozart and Haydn. That. Yeah, uh, Mozart and Haydn. Uh, wrote for harpsichord and wrote, it's, it was the same, wrote also for keyboard. And somehow at this period of time where the piano was, were emerging, sometimes you had like instrument, like just like by watching, you could not say if it was harpsichord or uh, piano, you know. And sometimes there is also instrument which were harpsichord and they use the box of the harpsichord and change the mechanic and did piano and and also the other way, like it was very uh, affluent, uh, uh, <laughs> uh between harpsichord and the piano in this period of time, like in the second half of, of uh, 18th century, and uh, and we can feel in also in in the evolution itself of Mozart music or Haydn music, like uh, all right, it's more we are playing more with the way of expression in the piano and, and stuff. But I think there is like a lot of pieces who could work on the harpsichord. And also like in a very young age, for example, Haydn or Mozart also, uh, when they were, it, it depends what they have, you know, like at home. And somehow like if they have a harpsichord and they were writing for a keyboard and the keyboard there was a harpsichord. It was like at the same, uh, maybe a position with the keyboard in general. But little by little, like the, the piano had more influence on the composer. And the harpsichord was getting more, uh, um, you know, away, getting away. 
And that's why, for example, in 19th century music, <coughs> the harpsichord was almost completely gone from musical stage. Because also the piano evolved a lot. Like the harpsichord evolved also very, very much for three centuries. Like you can find, like even like if you go in the museum or you can like watch in internet, like the thousand of different models of harpsichord and different shapes and sounds and stuff. And the piano had this uh, new also this uh, foisonnement of, uh, of uh, making uh, like in 19th century and also like it getting also bigger and bigger and the sound was uh, bigger and bigger so the concert hall was bigger and bigger and the harpsichord has a very intimate sound so the harpsichord could not fit in those halls concert halls we were creating and among a lot of different other factors of the di the disparation like the of the harpsichord last one question maybe <laughs> um I was wondering whether you um, bring your own harpsichord with you or play something from local sources, uh, and if it's, especially if it's your own, is there anything really noteworthy about the particular harpsichord? Um, so I'm playing everywhere <laughs> on the planet. Imagine, imagine if I would have to take my harpsichord in the plane. <laughs> so, but I wish I could, you know, like just, I'm sometimes very jealous of other musicians who has their own instruments. So they practice what they want to do in concert, like on their own instrument, and then they play on their own instruments. So it's a very difficult aspect of uh, harpsichord players to be able to change instruments all the time. So um, there is a very positive aspect. Sometimes you just meet very great instruments and, uh, and also the instruments could really influence you. Like in the present time of the concert, of you, you, you have to be very aware and careful of the sound, of the everything. So it's, in a way it's very difficult, but there is also very, a lot of posi positive aspects. And uh, for example, also when I I come back to a place I have already played in uh, and I started to knew to know the instruments around. I can also decide, oh, I think this instrument would be better because I know it and also for the repertoire and so. So for example, the instrument from tonight, I played it already uh, once or twice in Washington. So, but I don't play it every day. You know, so it's, it's, and I like it very much. And um, so it's, uh, it's tricky. <laughs> and sometimes it's very, very, very frustrating. <laughs> and sometimes you have very, very great surprise. So it's very challenging in a way. <laughs> All right, thank you very much.